right, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Sarah Parkak. I am an archeologist and Egyptologist. Um, you're gonna see my hat coming and going here today. I thought since I'm on Zoom all the time, I'm normally a professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, but um, given everything that's happening, I am now a first grade teacher to our seven year old. And I'm so excited to be teaching you today and to anyone else that's listening uh, to, to kids, to, to kids at heart. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by telling you a little bit about myself. And then today I want to share with you um, what it's like being an archeologist, uh, Egyptologist, how to be an archeologist or Egyptologist. Um, I also wanna tell you a little bit about the work that I do with satellites and mapping archeological sites. I also want to um, show you a lot of images of what an archeological excavation is like. I'm very lucky that I get to co-direct a project in Egypt working with uh, Egypt's Ministry of Antiquities and, and getting to work with many of my wonderful colleagues and friends. Um, I know we have a lot of really cool questions that uh, parents have posted from their kids all over Twitter. Um, and so I guess I'm gonna, I'll jump, jump right in. So I have loved Egypt ever since I was a small, small girl. Um, I can't tell you why this was in the 1980s, so long before uh, the internet, long before you know, being able to watch videos online, I credit my love uh, to National Geographic magazine. We get stories, um, not quite every month about Egypt, but often. And you can see behind me on Zoom, I figure if I'm gonna be on Zoom lectures a lot, I'm gonna get to show images of Egypt. So this image behind me is an image of the uh, palm groves of the fields right next to the archeological site where I work. And I'm actually dressed like an archeologist right now. I'll kind of show you a little bit. Um, so of course, the most important thing is you have to wear a hat because it's so hot. We wear lots of sunscreen. Uh, we don't wanna get skin cancer. So it's, it's essential to wear a hat. Um, you also have to have a scarf, which is what I have on right now. I like to get my scarves from, especially from uh, women, co uh, female co uh, owned cooperatives that work close to the site. And we wear a scarf because it helps to protect us. And also there's often dust on site. So you can just kind of like a bank robber a little bit to protect your face. <laughs> And it's plus it's stylish, right? Uh, I also have a um, button down, button down uh, Columbia shirt. I'm not endorsing Columbia specifically, but it just happens to be the one I'm wearing. You want to wear clothes that are protective, but also um, respectful because Egypt is a more conservative country. So we don't wear shorts on site. We don't wear t-shirts. Uh, we wear long trousers, oftentimes long shirts. I'm kind of, it's a short sleeve shirt you can, or shorter sleeve shirt, you can wear them, um, but we would, we would never wear shorts on site. Uh, we also wear hiking boots. Um, there's a lot of uh, sharp rocks you'll see in the videos I show in a little bit. Um, so I have been an Egyptologist for um, 15 years. I've been very lucky. I've not only worked in Egypt, I've gotten to work all over the world, uh, but mainly I'm an Egyptologist. That's where my, where my love is. I first got to go there actually exactly 20 years ago. So I guess I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how to be an archeologist because that's a big question that I often get from kids, um, kids of all ages. Uh, first of all, the most important thing to be an archeologist, and it's kind of a boring response, but you have to work really, really hard in school. Um, because archeology span now, it's not just about history and digging in the dirt, it's become much more science. So you have to study chemistry and DNA and physics and math and geometry. I did not understand how important geometry would be for archeology. span So thank you to my geometry teachers. Um, and I'm sorry that I ever asked why it was important. It's really important. Um, you also have to really love reading because the most important thing for archeology, span it's not that you're excavating dirt, it's that we spend a lot of time excavating in the library. We're looking for information, we're looking for clues, we're looking how to put all the data together um, to tell stories. So that's the other thing I wanna, um, I wanna share with you today is how we archeologists take little bits of information and put them together to tell better stories and ask better questions about the past. You know, I say in archeology, span we don't look for things, 
um, we, we were essentially looking for answers to questions. Um, so we're not looking for treasure. The real treasure is the information that we get out of the archaeological record. So before I dive into all that, I want to tell you a little bit about the work I do with satellites. And I'm going to see if I can do this without, well, there's definitely small child yelling in the background. So yes, yeah, so the first image I want to show you is kind of an iconic image from almost 100 years ago. So what you're looking at here is Howard Carter, and he is working in the tomb of Tutankhamun. This uh, tomb was discovered in 1922, um, so by, by Howard Carter and his team of uh, Egyptian excavators. And it's really famous because it's, it's actually probably the most famous archeological discovery of all time. Um, because the tomb was almost entirely intact. And this is kind of a really cool thing that a lot of people don't know. Everyone thinks the tomb was completely intact when it was excavated, but actually it wasn't. Um, what happened was when the burial party went in to bury Tutankhamun, they helped themselves. And what Howard Carter found in the tomb, in the little jars, he actually found handprints of where people had scooped out the creams and the other things that were in the jars. Because if you had a little, little, little handful of cream and you walked out, that didn't have the king's name on it. You could easily, um, you could easily sell that. So it wasn't entirely intact. But it's famous because when Howard Carter peered inside after unsealing the tomb, um, after 3,300 years, he was asked, what do you see? And he said, I see wonderful things. And that kind of that that kind of sets a tone for um, for how archaeology is perceived today, right? We think it's all about finding golden treasure, but it really isn't. There's so much more interesting information that's out there, and I wanted to share with you this absolutely amazing discovery that was found last fall um, by my good friends at the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities in Luxor. So here we have a map of Luxor. Are you so sharing your screen? Oh, can you see it? No, not yet. It, there oh, should be a button on the picture screen. Technical oh. difficulties. Hold on, wait. Let me see if I can do this. Um, okay, hold on, wait. Share screen. And, uh, wait, so you didn't see the Howard Carter image before? No, I don't think we did. But okay. Can you okay, now we can see it. Now you can see it. Okay, sorry. So there we go. So there's the image of Howard Carter. Apologies. I did not know I, I wasn't being shared before. Okay, so yes, yeah, so here's the image of Howard Carter leaning in. Um, so yes, yeah, so here's, here's an image of Luxor. So here's the modern town of Luxor, which is where most tourists stay. And if you go across the river, um, so this is from this area here. You can see um, pretty close to the Valley of the Kings, which is up here. And what our colleagues discovered was a cache of all of these absolutely gorgeous mummies. And you can see these are very, very brightly colored. There were several dozen of them discovered, and these are from the 22nd dynasty. Um, and you can see here this particular kind of coffin. There's Dr. Khaled al Anani, who's the director of Egypt's Ministry of Antiquities, and they're stacked one on top of the other. So I, I'm often asked, you know, how much is there left to find in Egypt? And the answer is, I think we've only found 1% uh, of all there is to find in ancient Egypt. You can see here this amazing image with Egyptian conservators, the media, uh, back when we could all stand closer than six feet to each other. Um, and this other amazing discovery, which is found near the Valley of the Monkeys. So here we have the Valley of the Kings, which is where King Tut's tomb was found. And my good friend, uh, uh, Fifi Rohima Fifi, discovered a new workman's village. And to me, this is so incredibly important because you know, I'm interested, I'm a settlement archaeologist, which means I'm interested in the stories of everyday life from ancient Egypt. And what he found was the first workman's village that's been discovered in a hundred years, it's only the second one that we have. And these, this, this place, these houses are where people stayed who were actually building the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And you can see all of these beautiful objects. So they were workshops, so they were putting things together to put into the tombs. And this is the other workman's village that we have. It's from a place called Daryl Medina. Um, and so it's, it's just these amazing discoveries keep, keep getting made. All right, so I'll see if I can get out of our, whoops, okay, there we go. Um, all right, and stop share, there we go. 
Okay, so I'm back. Um, so yeah, so so that's the other thing I want to kind of um, share with you today, just how much there is left to find, um, not just in Egypt, but all over the world. So for all the kids who are watching this, do not worry, even though I'm going to be talking today about finding thousands of archaeological sites using satellite images and showing you lots of cool images of the things we've found. You know, I firmly believe that your generation um, you know, you're already you're already learning how to code. You're already learning how to 3D print and invent and make things uh, with with Raspberry Pi and 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 um, there are all these amazing hacker and maker spaces that you're getting involved with. Um, I think that your generation is going to make the most extraordinary discoveries because when I was nine, ten, eleven years old, um, if you had told me that that when I was a grown up, that I would be using satellites to map archeological sites and I would then get to go out and find them on the ground, I wouldn't have believed you. So think of this, think, use your imaginations and imagine the most wild things you can. You know, things that you invent, thing, invent things that you've seen in movies. And I'm not a betting person, but I would bet money on you or anyone watching inventing those things and getting to go map and, and excavate sites. So I'm really, really excited about everything that you're going to find. I hope that you'll take take me with you on digs. Um, maybe by then I'll be I'll be retired and I'll just get to go from dig to dig. That would be super fun. So all right, so now what I want to do, let me see if I can get this up and running. Let's see share screen and share. There we go. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, what it means to use satellites and other types of technology to map ancient sites. So the really fun term for this is called space archaeology, and I'm not making this up. And I did not invent this term. That was actually invented by NASA. NASA coined the term space archaeology. So what does it mean? Does it mean we're looking for aliens? No. We're the aliens. It means that you're pointing satellites and other aerial platforms um, on, on helicopters and drones and UAVs back to planet Earth, and you're using it to map archaeological features. Why is this important? Well, so many archaeological sites and features get buried you know, over time. Think about this. Think about a house that gets abandoned, and think about, um, think about what happens to it over time, and slowly the house collapses, and the wind blows and it's covered with dirt and maybe vegetation starts growing on top of it. And that can happen over 50 or 100 years. Well, imagine what would happen to a whole town if it were abandoned and it were covered over by hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of years. How would we find it? And that's what archaeologists use satellites for. We're looking for subtle differences on the surface of the Earth. We're looking for slight differences in vegetation type and soil type, uh, and we're mapping them using different parts of the light spectrum. We're, think of it almost like a space-based like CAT scan or X-ray, right? You can't see your bones um, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at a body, but the X-ray allows you to see under the skin and to figure out maybe where you have a bone break or maybe where there's a problem. Um, that's, that's essentially how satellites work. They allow you to see subtle changes on the surface that show you what might be underneath. And sometimes this works really well in desert environments. I'll show you that in a second. Um, but where it can work incredibly well is in places um, that are covered over by trees. We can't see through trees with satellites, but what we can do, let's see if I can get that up and running. There we go. So this is work being done by my dear friend, Dr. Damian Evans, and he works at a place called Angkor Wat. And this was the capital of the Khmer Empire over a thousand years ago. And they built all of these extraordinary temples. Um, you'll often see the main temple at Angkor Wat reflected in, in, a, in a lake. Um, just beautiful, beautiful temples. But the main problem is that so many of the buildings surrounding the temples are covered by trees. You see that here you can't see through them. So this technology called LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging, can be flown on a helicopter or an airplane. And it sends down millions of pulse beams of lasers um, that allow archeologists to basically strip away the vegetation. And so you see these before and after 
You see all of these houses and structures that you simply can't see because the vegetation is there. Um, this, this work, um, this is from Guatemala in Central America. And as you all know, there's a lot of uh, rainforest cover in Central America. And this is, a, this is where the Maya lived. Maya had a massive empire, um, sort of a, a series of connected city-states, um, but it covered a huge area and it's mostly covered by rainforest. And so what my colleagues have done, uh, these are my friends Francisco Estrada Belli and Marcelo Canudo at T Tulane University. Um, so this is part of something called the Panicum Initiative. And they've used LIDAR connect, uh, collected from airplanes and they've been able to take away all the vegetation to get what's called an elevation model. So these are perfect models of everything that's there beneath the rainforest. And you can see very clearly where all the buildings are. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do next, it's pretty cool, isn't it? They found over 60,000 new features um, at, uh, at the site of Tikal, which if you've seen the, uh, the last Star Wars movie with all the, it's the rebel base on Endor. Um, so a little bit of nerd, a little bit of nerd trivia. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Um, so now I want to switch to Egypt to show you how this can work in terms of mapping whole cities. Hopefully we can get this work. So we're going to, we're going to zoom in on the archeological site of Tanis which um, of course everyone seems to know from, from Indiana Jones, but the archeological site of Tanis is so incredibly important. It was Egypt's capital about 3000 years ago. So from around 1000 BC, you can see the site here and French archeologists have been working there um, for over a hundred years. And you can see this is a temple to Amun-Ra. So there, there's been a lot of archeological work here, but the main capital of Tanis is down here. So this is a huge, huge, huge site. Here we have the modern town of San Al-Hagar. Thousands of years ago, the Nile River would have flowed right here. Anyway, so let's have a closer look. So we got high resolution imagery and processed it. And you're going to see a before. And now you're going to see an after. Everything you see is just below the surface. <clears throat> so here we have what could be a palace. Here we have buildings and other structures. And you can see very, very clearly the outline of the ancient capital city. And I want to say I'm not the only one doing this. Hundreds and hundreds of my colleagues are doing this work. Let me zoom out, I'll stop sharing. Um, so colleagues of mine are doing this work across the Middle East, so in Iraq and Afghanistan and Jordan and Peru and the United Kingdom and India and China and Australia. Um, this work is being done all over the world. Um, and what it allows archeologists to do, it's a starting point, right? You, you, you absolutely have to go out into the field, you have to excavate, you have to survey, you have to map anything you find. But it's great because before, you know, we had aerial photographs, but they were hard to get, you had to use an airplane. And what's helpful with satellites is that they allow you to pinpoint exactly where to go. And you can start that satellite work, um, you know, back, back in your home long before you go into the field. So now what I want to do is share with you what it's like um, excavating. So how does that work? How do you organize an excavation? What is it like in the field? Uh, what do you eat? Where do you go to the bathroom? All the big questions that uh, we, we often get asked. Um, so first of all, I want to emphasize that, uh, that, that archeological archeo excavations happen because of teams. You know, I just happen to be the director of, or rather co-director of the project. It means that I'm the main organizer. It means that I'm responsible for the money and more than anything else, I'm responsible for the health, safety and welfare of my team members. But it's not me. I don't get credit for the project. I work with dozens of specialists. I work with a large team of Egyptian collaborators. I work with large numbers of local villagers that are paid. Um, in Egypt, you have to hire a local workforce. And to me, everybody is the same on an archeological project, whether it's the, the boy from the village who's helping us get tea for our, our workmen 
to the people who are helping clean pottery, to our diggers, to our experts. Everybody to me is the same on our project. They're all just as important. So what I wanna show you first, if I can pull this off, is what a dig looks like. Okay, here we go. So what you're going to see um, is, I'll give you a little bit of background first. Zoom down a little bit. Okay, so. Did you see it yet? Did you share the screen? Yeah, I'm just hitting the button. Okay. Share the screen. And there we go. Okay, so this is an archeological site. Um, that is about two hours south of Cairo. It's called the site of Lisht. There we go. And so what we have here is the pyramid of at the first. And here we have the pyramid of Samoasr at the first. And this archaeological site dates to about 3,800 years ago. So this is a period of time known as the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. Now everyone knows the Old Kingdom because of the pyramids of Giza. Right, so that's roughly 2,600 BC or 4,600 years ago. Most people know the New Kingdom of Egypt because of King Tut. That's roughly 3,300, 3,500 years ago. But this is a time period in between from 3,800 years ago. So um, why is this site important? Well, first of all, the capital of Egypt is somewhere in the floodplain. It was called Itch Tawi which means the seizing of the two lands. It was founded by Amenemhat I during this period of time known as the 12th dynasty. Now, why was the Middle Kingdom important? Why should we care about the Middle Kingdom? Well, first of all, if you take hieroglyphs, if you take Middle Egyptian when you are at university or you start learning, which you can do, by the way, I might be happy to share some, some references and resources, you are probably going to start by learning the same language that was developed during this period of time. So this was Egypt's great Renaissance period. So the, the writing, the art, um, the architecture, uh, in my opinion, during, during the Middle Kingdom um, was, was exquisite. So you're gonna see a lot of images today from our excavation that really show you um, just the extraordinary art that was done during this time period. Many of the stories that we have from ancient Egypt. So the story of the shipwrecked sailor, the story of Sinue. Like I said, I'll, I'll be happy to share those, those um, references for, for folks reading at home so that you can read ancient Egyptian stories in translation. They were probably written at the site. So this was a, a, a great place for, um, for creativity and for art. The two kings that co-founded, that co-ruled together. So Amenemhat I was some wasp with the first father. They were co-regents, which means they ruled together. Um, they lived in the capital in a, probably a beautiful palace. And the thousands and thousands of people who would have um, lived and worked in the capital, so as artists, as administrators, as writers, as soldiers, as the people that weaved and baked the bread, um, that worked in the palace, they were all here together and they were all buried here. So at Lisht, which is the modern name of the site, um, there are thousands and thousands of tombs of all the people that lived and worked in Egypt. So I'm gonna see if I can show you. So what you're gonna see now is what life looks like on an excavation. <laughs> our team working. So we're working in a tomb of a gentleman named Intef, who was a soldier and a general under some Wasser the first. So you see our Egyptian team very carefully working. They're scraping down the mud brick. And you can see over here, this is our camp. Here's our colleagues from the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities. Here's the tomb we're going around Lisht. That's our rice, so that's our Egyptian overseer, Omer. He's a dear, dear friend of mine. There's my husband, Greg, working and measuring. So you see how carefully everyone is working. Ever, it's not going quickly. We're measuring. We're, um, we're working carefully. We're supervising. We're always communicating. We're talking very, very carefully. I'll show you one more video to give you a sense of so here we are removing some of the overburden in Intef's tomb. So they're removing dirt, they're going very slowly. You have to dig, to dig is to destroy, you have to dig very carefully.
And you can see these gentlemen wearing turbans here and here. You can see them supervising our workforce. All right, I'll stop sharing for a second so I can talk to you. There we go. Um, so those, those gentlemen are called guftis or kuftis, and they are part of a professionalized Egyptian um, excavation uh, force. Um, they're archaeologists, they're managers, they're, they help with conservation, they're extraordinary, and they've been working with archaeological projects going back 150 years. So the gentleman I showed you, Omer, you'll see him a little bit later. So he's sort of my counterpart. So I help with, so I'm responsible for money, for uh, well-being, for general, for, for, for management. I'm sort of like the, the general or the CEO. I manage a group of about 100 people. Um, so for all the, the young women that are watching, uh, women can and should be in charge. It's important. Um, the buck stops with me. Um, you know, I take my job very seriously. Um, I like to have fun on my projects, but all you know, I like to create an atmosphere of, of respect. But also, um, it is it is a heavy responsibility. You know, making sure that everyone has enough food is safe. Um, you know, when my workforce is um, working in in conditions, say they're working deep in a shaft um, that that doesn't isn't wet, you know, where there's a lot of dust, they wear ventilators. They wear protective gear. Um, in cases where that's not needed, they they don't. But I take that very seriously. Um, but my, my Egyptian counterpart, Omer, he's responsible for managing the workforce. So every day he takes role, he makes he sees who's there, who's not there, he helps with payment, he helps with preparing equipment. And you can't really hear me there. I think there are maybe some clips later on where I'm speaking Arabic. It's really, really important that you learn the language of wherever you're working. So I'm gonna teach you a little bit of Arabic right now. I'll teach you two phrases of Arabic. Um, so in the mornings, um, when you get on site, so we get up pretty early, we get up at about 5.30, uh, 5.45 for the drive to site, and that's in the winter. In the summers, we get up at 4.30 in the morning, because in Egypt, it's really, really hot, and you want to be on site working by six o'clock, because by two o'clock, it's too hot to work. You put in your eight hours, and then you go home. So we typically have, uh, when we get up, we have coffee and, and, and cookies. You want a little something, not too much. And as you know, all the kids out there, if your mommy and daddy don't have coffee, they get really grumpy. Well, we get really, really grumpy if we don't have coffee. It's really important. And then on site, by about 9.30 or 10 o'clock, we get really, really hungry. So we have something called second breakfast. So for all of you who are Lord of the Rings fans, J.R. Tolkien got it right. We are basically hobbits. We have second breakfast on site. So that's that's really important. I'll show you some fun pictures of, of food in a little bit. Um, so we get on site, we say hello, and then we start working. I want to show you some images of the tomb itself. Let's see if I can share screen. Slowly getting the hang of it. All right, so this is what the tomb looked like when we started excavating uh, back in 2015. And it may look a little bit funny to you because you've got this open area and everyone's working. Well, this tomb, it's called a T-shaped tomb. It's for classic tomb from the Middle Kingdom. So you can see the upper part, and this would have been the causeway, this would have been the hallway. And originally the tomb would have had a roof on it. But over time, because of earthquakes and quarrying, uh, the stone has been removed. You have these niches in the back, which you'll see more of in a few moments, and we're just starting the work. Now, initially, we didn't think we'd find much because the tomb was so heavily looted. After the Arab Spring in 2011, a lot of tombs, a lot of uh, sites in Egypt were badly looted, but we were very, very lucky. In 2015, we found the name of the tomb owner. You see it here. This is Intef, so that's the Egyptian sign for yin, so yin. And that's a T and that's a F. So Intef was his name. Intef was a pretty common name um, in the Middle Kingdom. It's sort of like Michael or John now. And you can see here, this is Intef. You're going to see more images of him in a bit. And you can see the amazing, amazing art that would have been around uh, back then. All right, sorry. Whoops, dropped that. So we were very, very lucky when we were excavating. We actually found some blocks that were in place. You can see here um, images of soldiers holding bows and arrows and spears. You see the name of one of his sons, Sinusret, and we see here his name, Intef Mes Ippi. 
And why that's so important is that Ippi was the name of his mother. We only have a couple examples of this from the Middle Kingdom. It's not like super, super rare, but it's also not really common either. So his mother was very, very important to him. Um, on excavations, what we do in addition to um, excavating is we, we map very, very carefully everything that we find. So we took hundreds and hundreds of points. If you remember from that video, there was the gentleman wearing the blue shirt who was carrying, uh, carrying around something to map. Um, so he took thousands of points and this is what the tomb looks like. You can see here and you get a much better sense of the fact that it's a t-shaped tomb and you can almost imagine the old roof on it so excavating over time um, this is what the tomb looked like in 2017 so we went back in 2015 2016 and 2017 and that's what the tomb looks like almost completely uh -huh. excavated and you can see here all these holes these are called shaft tombs so what happened was there would have originally been pillars six pillars here this would have been a columned hull and this is actually Intef's tomb, which is really cool. And there are a whole series of other tombs as well. There would have been a causeway leading down to the Nile. Um, you can see one of our Egyptian core staff very carefully mapping and measuring everything. This is one of our blocks. Um, so this is called, when we say in situ, it means in place. And this is a little offering table. So you can see images of vessel, uh, little, little uh -huh. ancient Egyptian vessels. They would have poured things in here to offer for the deceased. So this is a cemetery. And here you have our amazing Egyptian crew removing a stone. And I wanna show you that video. So let's see if I can get that up for you. So they're in the process of removing a stone that's been in place probably for a very long time. Wow. All right, so there was Omer um, telling me telling me what to look for. Uh, and this is the stone that they're removing. And why it's cool is that it ultimately led to the discovery of this, which is in Tef's tomb. Here's Omer working away. So you can see how important teamwork is on an excavation. It's not one person that's making a discovery. And that's unfortunately what you often see and read about in the news, this, this myth or mythology of the soul discoverer. But that's something for, for all the kids who are watching out there and all the parents, I want you to see today just how important it is that whenever a discovery gets made and you read about it in the news, it's never the, the director, it's never the author of the academic paper. It's actually probably dozens, if not hundreds of people that have helped to make that discovery. So here's what it looked like at the end of our season. You can see all this red brick in the tomb. And there, there would have been three niches in the back. And what we're doing here, um, so the other really cool thing about um, working with local villagers is that they are um, often using techniques that have been in practice for thousands of years. So the ancient Egyptians were really, really good at making mud brick. That's what you saw at Tanis. That's what the outlines of all those structures were. Those are mud brick foundations. And here we have one of our local villagers who is making mud brick because we are making new bricks to put on top of the tomb to help with conservation, to help with its protection. Now I wanna show you some really cool objects as a bit of a surprise and, and fun to, uh, to show you what things look like on an excavation. So here we have the face of Intef. This is moments after it has come out of the ground. Um, so we're the first people looking at this in almost four thousand years and you can see just how brightly painted it is so we don't just pull objects out of the ground when we excavate them we carefully map them we put them in place we draw them we photograph them and then we carefully remove them we put them in bags we tag them because then they go to our registrar that's the person who registers the objects they go to our artist that's the person that draws them they're carefully logged and then they're very carefully stored in, uh, and they go to the conservator, so the conservator is the person who conserves them. And then they're put in storage uh, at a Ministry of Antiquity storage facility. So what I'll do, oops, skip ahead a little bit. I wanna show you another video. Here we go. Here's working in one of the shafts. 
And this one is pretty, it's, it's not too dusty, so it's not, not dangerous. And you can see how deep we go. Sometimes we go 15 to 20 feet deep or more. Here are our goofies, here are our work staff, and you see just how carefully everyone is working. Safety is the most important thing. And what we think, we haven't been able to finish this because we, we just ran out of time, that often happens on excavations, uh, but another five or six meters down, we think this tomb could potentially have a coffin and other bits of material culture, and I'll show you. There we go. Close that out. I'll show you some of what I mean. Here, there we go. Right, so here's some amazing things that we found during our excavation. Here's an eye that actually was in a coffin. Here is an intact, whoops, here's an intact pot that we discovered. So these little pots were put in place. These were offerings that were made by people who visited the tomb thousands of years ago. Here is a soldier. You can see just how brightly colored these are. And these would have been parts of little statues, um, uh, little wooden statues that would have been placed as offerings in the tombs. So, and this to me, this is one of my favorite things. You can see just how brightly colored this painting is. Um, this is from an offering um, scene. So there would have been, um, there would have been scenes of, of vegetation, of birds, of offerings that would have been made by people who visited these tombs a long, long time ago. I okay, have one more video to show you, and then we're gonna turn it over to questions. Okay, so the other question that I often get asked is how did the ancient Egyptians build the pyramids? How could they have moved those stones? Well, I offer you this proof. So our work crew, we have a lot of heavy stones, that we remove, and you can see how carefully, so the stone is probably about five or 600 pounds. And you can see it's about nine or 10 men, and they've got to remove it from about eight feet down on this ramp. Wow. All right. So you can see that that stone is probably about maybe a tenth um, the size, uh, maybe not a tenth, maybe a fifth the size. So five or six of those together is about the size of a block that would have been used to build the uh, Pyramid of Giza, but there were only about eight or nine men. So if you imagine 30 or 40 men working together, moving those big stones, it's very easy to picture how the great pyramid was built, right? It's just men working together over time, over wow. a 20, 22 year period. Um, aliens didn't build the pyramids, we did. It's our innovation and creativity. All right, I've talked a lot. Um, I know there's a lot of information that I shared. I, I get really excited when I talk about this. I love doing it. So I wanted now to welcome questions. We've had a lot of really cool questions from people um, all over the, the internet. And I wanted to invite you to read them and ask questions of yourselves. Um, Luke, age five, had the question, why do they like the pyramid shape so much? Like why did, yeah. Right, so if you imagine, if you have um, younger brothers or sisters out there, right, and or you yourself like playing with blocks, the pyramid shape is the most logical one, right? You can stack things and it goes up. For the Egyptians, it was a symbol of the sun. Uh, but the pyramids, that, that shape, that design, didn't get designed overnight, right? Um, it, it, it slowly evolved over a 500 to 1,000 year period. So initially, the Egyptians put burials in the sand. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, and then they realized this would have been five, six, 7,000 years ago, um, but they had to protect the burials because the animals were digging and, and getting the bodies. So they started covering them, maybe with stones, um, maybe with, with, with mud bricks that they made. And then they realized they actually had to put the bodies deeper and deeper and deeper to protect them. Well, 
again, pretty logical, no, no, big, no big leaps ahead, no aliens. And then they started covering the bodies and started making little markers and small tombs. And as Egypt started coming together about 5,000 or so years ago, um, the tombs started getting bigger and bigger. And then they started making complexes for, for burying lots of goods for the kings. And these were known as mustaba tombs. So mustaba is Arabic for bench. So you have the tomb and you typically had an enclosure wall around it for the earliest kings of Egypt. Well, these started getting larger and more complex and they started being made of stone. And then about um, 3,700 years ago, this brilliant architect named Imhotep took what was a standard tomb design of a mastaba, and he started stacking them one on top of the other. So I call him the Steve Jobs of ancient Egypt, right? We have all these <laughs> geniuses throughout antiquity. Uh, and he just had the idea to stack the mastabas. And soon you have stacked mastabas. And then a little bit later, uh, a king called Sneferu made the first true pyramid and he just flattened the sides. So if you're ever wondering how did pyramids get to be pyramids, um, they didn't develop the pyramids overnight. They were developed over a really, really long period of time. Like 4,000 years. So on to the next question. River at age seven asked, why do you dig up what their ancestors built? Don't you think it will upset them? Do you? And then he had an added on question is, do you make sure you don't destroy the special things they made? That's a great question. So, so that gets into an area that we call archeological ethics. Ethics means, um, you know, is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing, what we're doing? And we think very carefully about the fact that we are excavating the graves of ancient people. So first of all, you could see just how carefully we were excavating. We weren't, you know, we're not digging and taking everything. We're working very carefully. We're digging in a scientific way. We're measuring, we're mapping, we're recording, we're taking pictures. We have uh, detailed excavation books that we're using to write down all the information. We're taking pictures. We are conserving everything. We're carefully drawing everything. We're carefully storing everything because what we're doing is we're studying it in order to put all the pieces together to tell the story of what happened on site. So we typically work um, on our project. I didn't have any pictures, but we have someone called a bioarchaeologist. And a bioarchaeologist is someone that studies human remains. We find a lot of bones on our project because we're working in a cemetery. Uh, and what bioarchaeologists do is they study the bones to learn about gender about or sex, to learn about disease, to learn about health practices, diet, trade. There's so much information that we can get out of um, learning about the past. So be, we really have to be careful. We have to be respectful. Um, and to the best of our ability, you know, tell these stories, right? I imagine what stories would I want told about me? How would I want people in the archaeologists in the future to, um, to excavate me? How would I want myself to be um, to be dug up. So that's really what I think about when I dig. Uh, and sort of to the second question, um, you know, we, we're just really careful when we excavate objects, we record everything, um, we map everything, and we put all the pieces together um, to try to tell stories. You know, we know Intef was a really famous general. He was uh, the overseer of the treasury. And we, we didn't know about him before. It's the first time that we have discovered uh, information about this, this whole new person from 3,800 years ago, and we hope to find out more when we go back in the future. Um, another question from Georgie, age six, was how do you find your way around and breathe while you are in the middle of a pyramid? And breathe. So that's an important question. So, so pyramids are often open. Um, there's air going down, uh, but sometimes when we go inside an old, old pyramid that's not typically open um, for the public, there are a lot of bats and there's a lot of bat poop, so bat guano, which isn't good for your lungs, so we wear masks. Um, you know, breathing is really important. You know, there are a couple of pyramids at the site of Lish that we're hoping to do some work on in future, and when we go inside, we're definitely going to be wearing uh, very heavy duty masks and protective gear uh, for anyone that goes in workmen to um, to, 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 to the core, core staff. But, you know, for example, if you go inside the, the Great Pyramid at Giza and so many other pyramids, you don't need to wear a mask. They're very clean. Um, you can go inside and, um, you know, just, just visit as a tourist. And I hope everyone uh, visiting today gets to, gets to visit someday. It's amazing to get to go inside a pyramid. 
Yeah. So the next one is Harry, who presents herself as female at age 11. She asks, what research do you do, you do in libraries as well as looking libraries. at in libraries, as well as looking at images and space? And then we have another question, which is Sola uh, after that. So. Okay, no problem. So yeah, so, so before you go on any project, so the first thing we have to do is we have to get funding to go excavate. Um, I've, I've excavated my own couch for, for money for projects and I found about um, 25 cents. So that doesn't get you very far because you have to pay for plane tickets for all your staff. You have to pay your workforce. You have to pay for food, hotel, transportation, equipment, um, fees. There's a lot that goes into any project. So the first thing we do is we apply for funding. So we apply to the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, National Geographic. We get a lot of money from private donors to help support our projects. We're just so grateful. There's so many people out there that, that are willing to support us. Um, and what you have to do is you have to write a detailed proposal. So you can't just say, give me the money, give me the cash. I mean, we joke about doing that, but you can't do that. You have to write a serious proposal. Why should they give you money? Why is the site important? What are the questions that you are going to be asking about the site? Why does it matter? What's your plan? How will you use the money? How will you gather all the information? What scientific tests will you be doing? Um, so you have to think very carefully about your, your project work. Also, alongside that, you have to put in an application. And this is the same, by the way, for every project all over the world. You can't just show up and start digging on a site. It's pretty much illegal. Right, that's looting, that's illegal, you can't do that. So you put in an application, in my case, to Egypt's Ministry of Antiquities. They take very seriously the permitting process. So you have to put in uh, your proposal to them, sort of like a grant. You have to write a lot of letters, you have to give the, the CVs of your team members. Um, you have to, of course, you can't just show up and, and apply. You know, it takes years and years to build the relationships that are necessary um, to do project work in Egypt. So I, I'm very active on social media. I'm very active on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, so, and, and, and I'm constantly um, speaking to my colleagues in Egypt. I'm constantly Skyping them. I'm constantly I'm on the phone with them because Preserving these relationships, building these relationships and friendships, to me, is, is, is more important than the permit. It's all about relationships to be able to do really good project work. So it takes a long time, and a lot of this involves work in the library. Because I now have read so many articles about Lisht. I just don't want to work there. You know, it's a site, it's a site where I hope to be working for a long time. Um, so, so I want to know everything that's been done. I'm with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York work there. For a very long time so i've read all their reports i've read books i've read articles about um, other projects that have worked at middle kingdom sites across egypt we look for things called parallels so in other words i found this pot on the site how many other archaeologists have found pots just like it all over egypt and potentially elsewhere um, and so for for me one of the reasons that i was drawn to lisht is because we did a lot of satellite mapping and we used radar data and we found the old course of the nile going by um, the edge of the desert. And so we've been able to do some augering work or coring work, and we found a bunch of pottery. So we're pretty sure that we have a good sense of where the capital city is, of Ichtawi, buried beneath the floodplain. Um, and hopefully we'll be going back soon to do more work after, after the coronavirus passes. Um, so the next question. Okay. Um, from Thula, uh, age seven, asked, what did you learn about archaeologists before you decided you want to be one? Um, uh, they have an archaeolog. They have an archaeo. She has an archaeo. She has an archaeology club at school. And um, did you? Oh man! If only I'd had an archaeology club at school <laughs> when I was a kid. That just would have been the dream. Um, Sadly, there was no archaeology club. Sadly, um, I grew up in Maine, and most of my digging was done in the snow and in my grandparents' backyard in sandboxes. So I did not have any excavations. All of you kids today, you're so lucky. There's World Archaeology Day, which is in the middle of um, October. Um, I'm a trustee of the Archaeological Institute of America. So parents that are watching that want to find out more information, go to archaeological.org. Um, there are all these amazing online um, uh, clips, uh, stories. Um, you can be, become a member of the Archaeological Institute of America, get information. There are tons and tons of dig days that are held at museums 
and parks around the country uh, where you can volunteer and participate, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's so many more resources now than when I was a kid. Um, you know, of course, I, I dreamt about Egypt. I read about Egypt. I read about archaeology. Every time there, there was a documentary on PBS, I watched it, but most of my learning was done in books um, before before I, I got into archaeology. The internet really wasn't around when I was a kid, um, so I kind of came to it when I took university classes. So all of you today are so lucky. There are so many more resources that are out there. Uh, so Gwen, age seven, asks Gwen, age seven, asks, "What do you find when you dig?" And what are you looking for? Great question. So we find all sorts of different things. Um, the majority of what we find on excavations is pottery. Uh, think about it. Think about most of what you have in your house. It's probably things like plates, dishes, spoons, and containers to put things in. Well, the same would have been for um, people who lived thousands of years ago. Um, they would have had their plates and their cooking utensils and their pots and their pans, but not quite pots and pans, right? They would have had, they would have had a lot of pottery. Um, and that's the majority of what we find. We found thousands and thousands of pottery shirts. Um, and our pottery specialists look at them, they organize them. Um, we don't tend to find, you know, as many objects as you might think, although if you're working in a tomb, you do find more. If you're working in a household setting, um, you find uh, objects from everyday life, so things uh, that people would have used for weaving, uh, needles for sewing. Sometimes if you're working in the desert, you find little pieces uh, from clothing. Um, so yeah, you find lots of different things. Every, every archeological project finds different things, but the mo majority of what most projects find working all over the world, if you're working in historic times, so sort of 5,000 plus years ago, um, you find pottery, if you're working on um, older sites, so from sort of earliest earliest humans, you find a lot of stone tools, if you're, especially if you're working in, in cave sites. Um, stone tools, so arrows, uh, choppers, uh, things for cutting, things for processing meat. You also find a lot of uh, animal animal uh, bones, the things that ancient peoples would have would have eaten. Um, I had something to add to that. We uh, I actually have, we have firsthand experience with digging. We were in Israel and there's a program called Dig for a Day because they have so many archaeological sites. You can pay them to actually dig for a day. And we found, and my sister found like an entire clay oven or parts of it with my dad and a lot of pottery. See, you know, you know, I'm telling the truth. That's awesome. Yeah, I've heard friends of mine have gone, um, you know, it's, it, the Israel Antiquity Service has this, this really great program. It's very high. I'm, I'm pretty sure when you went, that, like you were, you were pretty seriously supervised, right? Like there were specialists yeah. there to help you. Yeah. Uh, I know, for example, England, the United Kingdom, um, they have a really active public um, archaeology volunteer program. So there are programs where you can go on the weekend and dig, even if you're a kid. There's this amazing program online that I encourage everyone to check out. It's called Dig Ventures. Um, so there are volunteer programs where you can sign up to dig. Um, there's this amazing thing that I got to do for the first time a couple weeks ago called mudlarking. Um, so along the banks of the Thames River in London, um, if you have a license, you can go along. I just just observed um, you can actually pick up bits of pot because London has a 2,000 plus year history or longer than 2,000 years. And all this evidence kind of washes up along the banks of the Thames and with the tides coming in, it washes up all of this, these bits of pot. So yeah, so there are a lot of uh, museums, there are a lot of our, um, National Park Service sites where you can go and observe, if not excavate. So yeah, I encourage everyone who's watching to, uh, to learn more, to, um, to potentially volunteer, because it's a great way to learn. I would have, you know, would have loved to have started learning when I was eight, nine, 10 years old. Uh, uh, Ingrid, age seven. Uh, said someone told me that the Sphinx's nose was knocked off by a Napoleon. Is it true? So that is um, a, a myth. So it was definitely not knocked off by Napoleon. We know this because we have a lot of images that were um, uh, drawn by people who visited before Napoleon and the nose was gone. So the big question, the debate in Egyptology is when did this happen? Um, 
we don't know exactly. There are rumors that it could have been shot off maybe six or 700 years ago. Maybe the Mamluks did it. We, we don't know. It definitely happened before Napoleon, though, so um, fortunately. Cool. Our next Talia, age nine, asks, how did their civilization form, and who's the first ruler, and what's most exciting for you that you found? Like, what's the most exciting thing that you found? So, ancient Egypt formed about 5,000 years ago. Um, so it was, and to, to be honest, still is largely an agricultural country civilization. And slowly over time, the farmers, um, the people who were working the land, there would have been power centers. So the local rulers became more and more powerful over time. And as they gathered resources, as they were able to store things longer term, they focused on craft production. So that's, you see a real artistic tradition developing. And around 3000, sorry, around 3000 BC, so about 5,000 years ago, there was a king called Narmer who unified Egypt. So Egypt was divvied up into a couple of different kingdoms. And he, um, in kind of a great series of battles, basically unified all of Egypt. So he unified Upper and Lower Egypt. Uh, we know a lot about him because his tomb was discovered at a place called Abydos, so it's about a six hour drive south of Cairo. Uh, and that's really how the civilization started. It's, he was the first king. It's really, really important. Um, and that's where kind of concept of Egyptian kingship started and it lasted for 3,000 years until until um, the Ptolemies, until the Romans. Well, can you can you follow up with the second half of that question, please? Um, yeah. So she also said, what was the most exciting thing for you that you found? Right. So that, I get asked that question a lot, and it's really, really <laughs> hard for me to answer because I'm so lucky I've gotten to go on excavations in Egypt and Tunisia and Peru and Belize and here in the U.S. and Europe. And I, I, I'm so, so, so lucky I've gotten to go on all these projects, and I've gotten to find so many really, really cool things. So I say to, to people, the most exciting thing to me is the thing I haven't found yet. It's the next thing, right? Because to me to, to dig is like, it's the coolest thing I get to do. And it's such a privilege and such an honor. I try never to take it for granted and getting to dig, you just never know what you're going to find with that next pull of the trowel. And yeah. whether it's a little, little bit of pottery or a little amulet or, or something bigger, you know, I have found gold a couple times, which is pretty fun. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's cool to find the thing, but then you have to ask, okay, why is this important? What, how does this help me to tell the story of, of this site, of this place, of this city, of this cemetery? And how does that tie in to everything we already know, right? Because typically one object doesn't change the whole story, right? It's hundreds and hundreds of objects and, and bits and pieces over the course of a season and then you spend a long time analyzing it and then the really cool thing is is what you get to find out. So yeah, so archaeology, you know, it's not what you find, it's what you find out. So it's the next it's the next yeah. thing I haven't found yet. Um Clemmy, age eight, um, wants to be the first person that finds Cleopatra's to tomb and she wants to know any tips. Okay. I hope someday when you dig you'll let me come dig with you. Uh, so I highly, highly recommend uh, I'm going to spend my retirement going from dig to dig to dig to all these kids who tell me that they're going to lead excavations. I'm so excited to dig with all of you. So excited. I'll totally bring snacks. I bring great snacks and I make great mm -hmm. cookies. Uh, and, and you can have all the soda you want when I come on your projects. So don't tell your mom or dad and gummies. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so anyway, so what I recommend you do is you start reading about Cleopatra because we don't know where her tomb is yet exactly. So the big question is, where's her tomb? Is it somewhere in Alexandria, in the city, or could it potentially be underwater? Because there were a lot of earthquakes, and a lot of the ancient capital city of Alexandria is currently in the ocean, in the Mediterranean. I've seen all sorts of debates. I've read all sorts of papers. It's probably beneath the ocean, but I don't know. There are parts of the city where it could still be. So I recommend you read a lot about her. You should probably learn Latin and Greek really important to learn ancient languages. You have to know a lot about history. You have to learn a lot about science because you're not going to find her tomb using standard archeological tools. You're going to have to learn 
how to look at satellite imagery, how to use ground penetrating radar. You may even need to learn how to be an underwater archeologist. So you may need to learn how to dive and snorkel. You can start by snorkeling in your bathtub. I'm very sorry to your mom and dad, because now you're gonna to wanna to snorkel and you're gonna to wanna to snorkel in the bathtub, but that's totally fine. All good exploration starts at home. Um, and uh, you learn more and more, and then you start developing questions and theories. Right, because then archaeology to me is a science. You have all these ideas that you want to test, and then you get to put in proposals and you get to test them. So work hard in school, study as much as you can about Cleopatra, and I'm very excited to be reading the headlines where you've discovered her tomb. I hope I'm there. <laughs> um, and then Abigail, age six, asks, "Do archaeologists always dig?" So this is a great question, and the answer is no, we don't. Um, if you're an archaeologist, it doesn't necessarily mean you dig. There are archaeologists who are specialists in pottery, in stone, in human remains, in uh, plant remains. There are archaeologists who speciali specialize in the conservation of archaeological objects and artifacts. There are museum curators who are really important. Some museum curators are archaeologists. Uh, there are some people who are archivists, so people who study um, records. There are people who study language. Um, so no, not everyone digs. Um, you don't have to dig to be an archaeologist per se. Um, there are lots of people who work on our projects that are essential for helping us process the material, and they're not digging, right? You know, you're, they're looking at our pottery, they're looking at our bones, they're helping us with conservation, they're helping us with putting putting the bits and pieces back together. Um, so yeah, definitely, you do not have to dig to be an archaeologist. So Callie, age nine, asks has two questions. What drew you to Egypt, and how do you use the little things you unearth to find out the big picture stories? Great question. So I have been in love with Egypt ever since I was four or five years old. My parents do not understand why. You know, I grew up in central Maine in the 80s. There was nothing to pull me to Egypt. I didn't get to watch a show on TV. Um, you know, maybe it was National Geographic. Um, you know, like so many other archaeologists who are in their sort of 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, I, I watched Indiana Jones. That came out when I was a small child. It definitely very problematic. Um, we, do, we talk a lot about how that's not real archaeology today by a long shot. Um, but, you know, I, I can't help that that was a formative part of my, my childhood. Um, you know, that's just the, the truth. Um, but, yeah, I just, I was just drawn to Egypt from a very, very young age. Um, so how do we put all the little things together? So what we do, we very carefully collect information about pottery beads, bone, um, seeds. We look at the layers and layers of information. I didn't really talk about that today, but we very carefully go down layer by layer by layer. And then at the end of a season, we put all the information together. We look at all the analyses, and then we start looking at how the layers relate to each other and how the pottery changed, how the art changed, what objects we found. And we very carefully, it's almost, think of it almost like weaving together uh, a tapestry. Right? We have all these little threads of information and we're weaving and weaving and weaving. And at the very end, we only have little pieces of it. So we have to try to find examples from other time periods and other cultures uh, and, and previous excavation work that's gone on. Um, and, and we use all that to try to put together a story and we do the best job we can, but the story is always changing. Um, as more evidence comes in, as we do more work on that side, as archeologists find out new information. And that's why you're seeing so many new headlines from around the world because the story keeps changing. And to me, that's what's so exciting about archeology, span right? The story's not written yet. We're constantly writing and changing and, and making changes. And this will bring us to the last question, which was from a fifth grader. And they asked, what do archeologists know about the Sphinx? Right. So we know um, that, um, that it was certainly, a, there's a big debate, is the Sphinx um, 10,000 years old? No, it's not. You know, it was, it, it was built at the same time as the pyramids, the pyramid complex. Um, and, and what's really cool about the Sphinx, so we know the lion um, was like a protective deity for the ancient Egyptians. So we think of it like a big, a big protective creature kind of standing there on guard protecting the pyramids and the pyramids have been around now for um, goodness for um, 4,600 years and what's really cool and kind of blows my mind when I think about it we are closer in time to Queen Cleopatra going back to the earlier question than Queen Cleopatra was to the time of the pyramids 
Isn't that kind of wild? 2,600 years versus, versus 2,000 years. So they were already ancient when Queen Cleopatra was around. Um, so yeah, we know a lot about the Sphinx. Archaeologists have, have mapped it, have analyzed it, have assessed it. Um, there's a lot of great information there out there on it. I encourage anyone to, to look it up. In particular, there's a project um, being run by someone called Mark Lehner, that's L-E-H-N-E-R, and it's the ERA project, A-E-R-A. -E so if you look at, I think it's A-E-R-A.org, and the project being done by Dr. Mark Lehner and his team, um, he, they've been excavating the Workman's Village, so the, the, where the people lived who built the pyramids and the Sphinx. Um, and you can read tons and tons about the Sphinx there. There are all of these amazing 3D models and 3D constructions. So yeah, we know we know a lot about it. I don't think so. Any questions to, to kind of finish up? No, not really. You explained it well. All right, well thank oh, you. Uh, sorry, there is one more. One more, okay. If you want to read it. Uh, you can read it. Okay. Um, uh, have you been able to look at the uh, Chichen Itza where the ceramic warriors were? The what? Sorry, can you read that again? Have you been able to look at the Chichen Itza where the ceramic warriors were? I see the like. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I'm I'm not a specialist in that part of the world. You know, I certainly read about the Aztecs, the Maya, uh, the Inca, the Chimu, the so many other cultures from around the world. Uh, but I'm, you know, I uh, unfortunately there's there's so much to learn and so little time. That's why on Twitter um, I follow so many great archaeologists. I love learning about um, the diverse cultures of, of Central America, of South America. Um, you know, I love visiting different archaeological collections in museums. So I know a little, little bit about lots of different cultures, and I know a lot about Egypt. Um, and I've learned that my, um, my brain can only take so much. It's hard enough keeping up with all the amazing discoveries that are coming out of Egypt, as you saw the start you know there's so many things being found all the time but to me that's that's what's so exciting about archaeology there are all these amazing discoveries um, that keep getting made uh, you know we're pushing back the date of, of, of us of homo sapiens we know now you know before we thought we went back a hundred thousand years then 200 now there's evidence for homo sapiens 330,000 years ago in, uh, in in East Africa, which is extraordinary. So our story, our human story, is 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 still being told. We're still finding out more and more, and we're going to keep finding out all these cool things. And it's up to everyone listening, right? There's some future archaeologists out there. I bet I'm going to be reading about some of your discoveries in just a few years. And with that, I think I'm going to end. Thank you all so much for uh, for listening. Thank you all so much. I hope you're yeah, all the parents out there are able to use this. I hope you're able to find um, some of the resources that I mentioned um, useful uh, and, and, and helpful. Like I said, go to the Archaeological Institute of America website, go to the ERA website. Um, there's tons of great stuff out there. You can follow me on Twitter at hashtag INDY from space. I post lots of great content all the time. And I'm going to be sharing as well on um, some great follow up threads that have been done by my archaeological colleagues. There are amazing, probably hundreds of hundreds of online lectures um, and lots of great resources for all of you to use since so many of us have become um, stay at home uh, uh, homeschooling parents. And I want to give, give, give a huge shout out to all the amazing, amazing, amazing teachers. Huge claps to all of you out there. Um, you're extraordinary. You should all be making a million dollars a year or more. We don't pay you enough. We don't appreciate you enough. You're not, you're not resourced enough. Um, I think you're all extraordinary. Uh, I, I, I can't wait for our son to be back uh, being taught by people who are actually trained in how to be teachers. Um, so big shout out to all of you. Thanks to all my teachers who helped me to get to where I am today. Thanks to all the teachers of all the kids who are out there at home right now. I just want you all to know how deeply, deeply appreciated you are. You're all heroes and heroines to me. I appreciated you before. I appreciate you to the millionth degree now. So thank you for being amazing teachers. Uh, and, I, and I hope all the parents out there are just able to, to use this and, and um, all the kids are out there able, able to, uh, to enjoy it. And I, I certainly um, can't wait to hear more of your questions. You know, post questions on Twitter after you see this and I'll be happy to answer, answer more questions. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.